In this video, I'll be using the very popular tool which was recently released by OpenAI called ChatGPT. My name is Vinayak and I am a mechanical and aerospace engineer. I have a master's in mechanical engineering, currently working in aerospace. So I'll be using this ChatGPT tool to see if it can help me solve common problems in rocket propulsion, guidance navigation and control, find an element analysis. So I'll be covering different topics in mechanical and aerospace engineering and see if chat GPT is of any use to us. I predict that it will be. So let's actually check it out. Let's begin. I will start off with rocket propulsion. The first question will be explain rocket Rust equation in simple terms. Wow, okay, so it does give a detailed answer. So it did give the basic form correctly. It just ignored the pressure part of it. Pressure at the exit minus pressure outside times the area. But it, it's assuming that I'm finding the ideal value. So it's ignored that part. So that's fine. And it talks about the mass flow rate the exhaust velocity along with the temperature pressure so yeah like all these points are good looks like it does give a detailed answer if you ask a question so that's awesome okay my next question will be write a c plus plus or let's say a pseudocode to calculate the speed of sound given the ideal gas constant that's gamma Oh, sorry, no, that's R. The specific heat ratio that that's gamma and then the temperature is T. So you, you know that the speed of sound is square root of gamma RT. So let's see what this output is here. Wow, so it does actually give the correct equation. That's awesome. So looks like it does know pretty much everything in mechanical engineering. As long as the general stuff and it talks about what the formula is and what each term is so that that's also good it could be useful for your work okay right pseudocode to determine the pressure behind a normal shock now this one is more specific but it is out there because we have the isentropic flow equations as you all know supersonic speeds so it should know this one too. Okay, looks like it's there. I like how it actually tells you what each term is. So then you don't get confused at all, right? So G is gamma here, right? If you look at the NASA formulas, gamma is your specific heat ratio. And then the pressure downstream and upstream, that's P1 and P2. And then the Mach number will obviously change. So. It is assuming 1D steady flow, that's isentropic flow, same thing. We don't have any losses for in friction and like all that. So, okay, now I'm going to ask what is the boundary layer in fluid mechanics? As you know that the boundary layer, the velocity is zero at the base. And then as you go up, it increases to the free stream velocity. Wow, so it does talk about laminar and turbulent. So that's good. If it's laminar, it'll be like a straight line. And then turbulent, it'll be like more scattered. Yeah, so the Reynolds number, that's uh, density times velocity times the diameter divided by the viscosity, rho v d over u. So it talks about that here in brief, such as velocity, viscosity, and roughness. So that's good. And now I'll ask a bit more specific. Is the speed at the edge of the boundary layer in laminar flows the same as the free stream? So is it the maximum speed? Wow, so that is a good answer, right? It, it tells you that, okay, the peak is at the edge of the boundary layer, but it is a bit less. It's about 0 0.99 if you look at the formulas, but it's also mentioning that based on the conditions of your flow, it'll change. If it's a cylinder, then yeah, it makes sense that it'll be downstream because the cylinder itself will slow down the fluid around it. So far, I'm very, very impressed with this application. It does give very detailed answers. 
Okay, now I'm going to ask, explain the difference between an oblique shock and an expansion fan. So as you know, expansion is the opposite of a shock. In a shock wave, the pressure gets higher, the temperature goes up, but in expansion fan, it's the opposite, right? Expansion occurs outside the rocket engine nozzle, as you know, because the area is increasing, so it'll expand the flow around it. So this answer is pretty much perfect. So, yeah, I'm very happy with this. <laughs> Um, is the okay let's see here yep is the Mach number one at the middle of the rocket engine nozzle because you know I talked about this in my video long ago about how a rocket engine works so normally the Mach number is less than or equal to one based on your flow when it chokes it gets to one so Yeah, that's perfect. So if it's one, when the flow reaches the sound speed at the, the middle, so when it's when the gamma or T, that's the value, the temperature, and then when the flow reaches that, it'll be Mach 1, so then it'll reach Mach 1. So yes, it does vary depending on the operating conditions. Based on the pressure outside, it'll change. Okay, so now let's move on. Let's write pseudocode to return. A PID controller so you know that's proportional gain integral gain and derivative gain I'm going to talk about control system design now so we have KP KI and KD so you know the formula is KP times your error plus KI times the integral of the error and then KD multiplied by the derivative of the error so this should give the correct output So I'm actually specifying the variables myself. You don't have to do it. It'll actually tell you the default variables if you don't, but it's fine. Yeah, so we have the error, that's set point. So the value that you want to achieve minus the value that you measure, that's the error. You find this integral derivative and then you get the PID output. So that's, yeah, that's exactly it. I do prefer to ask it pseudocode because I actually want to choose the language myself. I don't want to say, okay, do it in Python or C++, although you can if you want to, to save a bit of time. But yeah, we have the PID controller general formula here. Now the PID controller itself has more details like noise cancellation and noise figure and the filter coefficient, but I'm not talking about that here now. I'm just asking the general formula. And then now let's talk about LQR versus MPC. So LQR is a linear quadratic and MPC is model predictive control. And MPC is like the constrained LQR. If you have constraints on your inputs, then you have to use MPC with optimization. But LQR is a general control design scheme so we have here yes LQR is a quadratic cost function it's x transpose qx plus utru but MPC is custom you can choose your cost function so it says you're based on a cost function right it doesn't say okay is it quadratic or not it just telling you that you can choose the cost function and you can have input constraints where it'll do the optimization and then solve it Yes, and MPC can be used for non-linear systems, right? You just have to use non-linear optimization. So yes, very good answer. Okay, now let's move on a bit. Let's talk about WGS84. So that is the Earth's coordinate system. If you work in aerospace especially, you will have to know this for your job and stuff. So it's basically the Earth's mathematical representation. It talks about latitudes and longitudes and assumes that the Earth is a spheroid. So yeah, we have the X, Y, and Z there. So WGS84 was made many years back, so it is quite popular now. In MATLAB, you have a toolbox for it, in the aerospace toolbox, which I've talked about again in the past. So yes, perfect answer. Move on. So this one, let's give it a different question. Let's say 
I want to convert latitude, longitude, altitude to ECEF, which stands for Earth Centered, Earth Fixed. So these are different coordinate systems to represent the location of any object on the Earth. So one is latitude, longitude, altitude, and one is X, Y, and Z. So it's a different frame of reference. And let's see what the output is here. So this formula is actually quite popular. It can be found in papers online. So I think OpenAI, like they know this because they have found it in some research article before. So yeah, we have A and B, that's the Earth's terms. So these are constant values. And then, yeah, you find the sine and the cosine of the latitude and longitude, and then you find the ECEF from there, X, Y, and Z. So actually in the MATLAB aerospace toolbox, you can actually use this function that's built in to save your time. So you can just plug in values and then get it. But yeah, this is a perfect answer. And it tells you the ECEF based on the LLA term. Yeah, I am very amazed with this. I hope the final version is much better. Let's continue. So I'm gonna say explain the difference between the rapidly exploring random trees and the RRT star. We are now into motion planning. So let's talk about that a bit. I made videos on the past and I have a Udemy course which covers these algorithms in detail. So yeah, just making a plug here. If you're interested, then check it out, it's free. So yes, RRT and RRT star are motion planning algorithms. You have to find a path by sampling from a start to a finish point. RRT star does two steps. It does a step called connect along a minimum cost path and then rewire. And in my course, I talk about this in full details. So now I'm going to ask for pseudocode for the RRT. Now I actually explained the full RRT in my course where I actually use an image and I do it. But let's see what uh, OpenAI gives us. I'm sure it should be pretty good. So I'm saying, okay, here I have a binary matrix as my configuration space where zero is a free space and one is an obstacle. Now let's see what the algorithm is. Now, I hope it does not give the full output because you do need a helper methods to complete the algorithm fully, but I hope it just tells you the pseudocode at least. So let's see here. Okay, so it looks good so far. Okay, that's my root, the start point. Number of iterations, good. Yeah, so while we don't have the goal and iteration is number lower than the max iterations, then you sample a point, you find the nearest point. If there is no obstacle, then you add at that point, you increment the counter, and then if the goal is reached, you stop. But if it is not reached, then you will have to continue in the loop. So this looks pretty nice. But it's not the full code, right? It's just like a pseudocode for it. You have to still define the method for sampling a point and then nearest, find the nearest. You have to recursively search along the graph and then find the nearest node to that point. Again, I talk about this in my course, so I won't explain this too much now. But the RRT algorithm is a popular algorithm. It's well known. It's established. Same with the RRT star. So yes, you can see at the bottom that we do assume that these helper functions are defined. And in my class, I talk about uh, defining the helper functions in full detail. So yes, this code is pretty much bang on target. My code is exactly the same as this one, but with everything defined, of course. So you have to find the path when the goal is found and then you just return it. Okay, now I'm going to ask it a bit more specifically for RRT star. So I'll say, okay, write code for the RRT star given the same thing, but I'll say, okay, write the C++ or Python uh, code for it. So now I'm asking Python specifically, not just any pseudocode. So let's see here. So RRT star will have the two steps, which is connect along a minimum cost path and rewire. But the rest of the algorithm is structured the same. You have number of iterations. You have the finding nearest point, checking if it lies in an obstacle. So yeah, and then you have to find the points within a neighborhood distance. If the cost is lower, then you update the parent and then you connect along a minimum cost path. So once again, this time it actually gives you the helper functions, which is quite mind blowing. So it actually tells you more details. You find the distance. So that's Euclidean distance between each point. Update the parent. That's fine. 
you actually don't need a helper function to update the parent you can just do it in the main code itself so now here for the points within the radius it just assumes that the node object the graph is like an array but actually you have to use recursion to find it so it's not a mistake per se but it's assuming that the data structure is linearly arranged but actually it'll be a left and right node right so you have to use recursion and find it not like this for loop there so that's one small difference but but overall it's quite nice the path is exactly the same as my code in my course you have to like search backwards and yeah so these are the helper functions they look pretty nice and obviously you will have to tune this based on your specific case because you may have more iterations you may have a different configuration space your sampling might change I'm this, this is super awesome like it actually tells you in the whole algorithm so yeah that's cost update the parent and for the last one the path you just have to start up the goal and then search along the parent so it, it didn't know that's the correct way to do it because there's only one path from the goal to the start so you have to start off with the goal and then search it backwards as you can see here while the point is not the start you just go to the parent and you just keep appending it to the path now like obviously it didn't find the, the distance of the path but I didn't ask it to do it I just said okay find the path itself but to find the distance you simply add the values to the parent so once again if what I'm saying now sounds like very strange to you this is a motion planning algorithm and yeah just go to my course if you want the full details of it let's ask one question for computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis so this is like a general question i'm like okay should i use a structured or unstructured mesh because they both have applications i've made videos on this long back i used to use ansys many years ago and then i made some clips on that but yeah we have a two meshes type structured and unstructured in structure it looks like very nice where it's all like you can find each element clearly but an unstructured is like more of a messy irregular pattern but yeah this answer is nice so like it says that if the geometry is simple then just use a structured mesh but if it is not then use an unstructured one and it talks about the advantages and disadvantages of each so yeah I'll stop here for now it's pretty good I'm very extremely happy with this tool so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I will see you guys next year.